So Linus Tech Tips, the group known for building absolutely insane computers, pushing the edges of what a computer can and honestly should do, set up a petabyte of storage, actually multiple petabytes of storage. However, they did it kind of completely wrong because of some key reasons. And because of that, they corrupted a lot of files and have had to spend the last eight months trying to rebuild them. And so in this video, I'm gonna talk about what went wrong and why from a technical perspective and why fundamentally right off the bat, it was not like they configured anything incorrectly, though that is technically why it did not go well. It was actually inevitability because of the hardware they were using and why overall, unless you have at least 50 people on IT staff, you should not touch clustering of file systems for a very long time. All right, so first off, let's talk about what happened. So Linus Tech Tips, known for building everything out to the absolute extreme, wanted to get a single petabyte server. So a single SMB target that was one petabyte. But at the time, the maximum drive size of any one hard drive was 10 terabytes. And so that meant that there was no way to do it in one chassis. And so because of that, and the fact that we're using 45 drives, they had to cluster everything together. 45 Drives is an awesome company who I really respect. They do a great job of making really great builds that are very high quality and priced very directly. You can go on their site and they will tell you exactly how much something's going to cost. Whereas if you go to Dell, you will get quoted significantly higher than that. They are great for that, but there is one issue they have. 45 Drives build their entire file servers with direct SAS connections. They do not use SAS expansion. And so because of that, you are one, limited on the number of drives you can have, and two, you have to have a single computer in every single chassis. Now, I wanna talk about why that's so bad here. And this is only an issue for somebody who is going beyond the petabyte. So today, you can actually use one of their 75 drive units to get 1.2 petabytes of actual usable storage after you've incorporated RAID. But if you wanna go over that, unfortunately they do not have an option because now you have to buy a second server and you should never do that unless you have a department that is at least like 50 people who really know what they're doing when it comes to technology. Because clustering two file systems together is way worse than it sounds. And so I really wanna preface this by saying 45 Drives is a great company and they make a great product. But it is like using the wrong tool for the job when you're trying to go over 1.2 petabytes and you specifically want a file system that expands over that. If you're okay having two different targets, perfect. Add them like that, way easier. But if you're trying to go a single file system above 1.2 petabytes, it's just not an option, honestly. Unless you really know what you're doing and you are comfortable having an entire ID department manage all these servers. It's almost never worth it to have a cluster unless you're going to have at least like 20 units. Because the amount of configuration required to set one of these things up and make sure everything is running fine is huge. And there's a lot of performance issues with it. For an SMB file server, which is what you use on Windows, Mac, and Linux to actually just grab files for sharing your normal office file server. They perform horribly over clustering. They technically work, but unless you've got a huge client ratio where you've maybe got 10 times as many clients as servers that are actively using it, and you're okay with all of them having like a 100, 200 megabytes per second connection to the cluster, you are not going to get much performance out of them because clusters are designed when you have a ton of clients all connecting down to a few servers. If you do not have that 10 to one ratio is kind of where most people draw the line, you are going to get really bad performance because when you've got that few clients, your servers are not being overloaded. And so clustering them out doesn't really give you much of an advantage. But just simply for this setup, 45 drives is not the solution at least not yet. I'm really hoping they add what's called SAS expansion and I'm gonna talk through what that is. Okay, so in a regular 45 drive server, we got some hard drives here and a Raspberry Pi. Essentially every single one of these hard drives 
is directly connected via a lane to the actual computer itself, the CPU. Now that means if you've got so many hard drives, you've got to have one, a lot of PCIe lanes, and two, you cannot expand outward from your chassis. And so this works great for a small number of drives because every single one of these drives gets the maximum throughput allotted to it, which for a SAS 3 is 12 gigabit. So every single one of these drives gets 12 gigabit pretty much directly into the CPU. But fundamentally, this unfortunately has a limit based off your number of PCIe lanes. So the pretty much maximum HBA card you can get has 16 ports on it. And so that means every single one of your HBAs, which has to have a PCIe slot, is limited to only having 16 drives. For most people, that's way more than you need. But when you're talking about hundreds of drives, that's just impossible. You, you cannot get enough PCIe lanes, at least today, to have everybody with their own direct connection. But this has been solved using what's called SAS expansion. So instead of every single one of these hard drives directly having a port to the Raspberry Pi or the CPU, instead of what happens is there's a middleman who is called a SAS expander. This middleman essentially operates in between the two and groups a bunch of hard drives together into a single SAS lane or multiple SAS lanes. What that means is you don't have to have one HBA for every 16 drives. Instead, with SAS expansion, every single HBA can handle easily a thousand drives. And so because of that, that limit's pretty much just gone. And so now you can have so many more drives accessible. And you do lose performance with this, at least on paper you do. Without SAS expansion, you have the direct connection, so every single one of these hard drives with SAS 3 gets a 12 gigabit connection to the CPU. The thing is, hard drives can't use that. SSDs can use that, but hard drives really just can't. And so hard drives themselves can only really do like 250 megabytes per second on a really, really good day. And so that's only two gigabit. And so that extra 10 gigabit is pretty much completely unutilized. There is a slight amount of overhead in that SAS expansion, but it's pretty negligible overall. So because of that, SAS expansion lets you just combine all these hard drives together into a single port, which makes everything so much easier and cleaner to manage. So what you're able to do, especially in ZFS, is just, okay, you need more storage, slot another JBOD, and boom, now you can expand out your volume to whatever you need and just connect them with SAS expansion. It allows you to have so many more drives accessible and just clean up your entire configuration. And so because of the awesome benefits of SAS expansion, every single business, unless you're an absolute enterprise and you have an entire IT department that's massive, should only ever have two file servers per use case. One, the active one, and two, the backup one. Those are the two file servers you ever need because you should only have one CPU in there or dual CPU configuration, but you should never have multiple clustered together because it is going to really hurt. Configuring a clustered file system, unless you have a large IT department, is just asking for trouble and is almost always going to give you much worse performance. All right, and so now that we know what the beauty of SAS expansion, let's talk about kind of what Linus Tech Tips did and what went wrong and kind of why. And so as I said, because of the limitation on what they were using for their storage and they could not get a single petabyte in one unit, they had to split it among two different units. And because there was no SAS expansion available with 45 drives, they had to get two different servers. You can have just two different file systems and that's okay, but they wanted one petabyte accessible and so what they did is they connected them together with ClusterFS. There are two different technologies that are really used for clustering massive file servers. There's Ceph and there's ClusterFS. Both of them kind of do the exact same thing. They're very difficult to administer, but they essentially allow you to combine a bunch of different storage together on a bunch of different CPUs, a bunch of different servers into kind of one accessible target. They are very performant when you have thousands of clients because you can start scaling out your actual storage servers. And so you can do things like geo replication, all of those cool things. And it is great. 
but that is incredibly difficult to build. Even if you're using something like TrueNAS Scale, you really should not be using GlusterFS unless you're doing backend storage for a massive website. Things like that where it actually scales is the only time you really should be using it. Instead, really focus on just having one single server. And so because they wanted to go GlusterFS to combine the two, they had no turnkey solution. Turnkey solutions for a file server are absolutely crucial. If you're playing around with your Raspberry Pi, yeah, command line everything, do it. But when you're actually running a business, you need a turnkey solution unless you have a massive IT department who knows every single thing that needs to be added in. Turnkey solutions like TrueNAS are absolutely huge because they set everything up. Instead, what they had to do because there was no turnkey solution, they had to build their own. And while you can do it, you can get it to work. You are not going to configure everything properly. So what they did is they essentially built the entire GlusterFS via command line. And so what happened is they got no email notifications because those aren't baked in. They got no automatic scrubbing of disks because that's not built in. They got nothing automatically built in. And so because of that, it is an absolute inevitability that the file server was going to go down for some reason. Essentially what happened to them is they did not turn on scrubbing of disks. This is one issue that can go wrong, but there's tons more. So data scrubbing is a crucial component of both ZFS and BTRFS, your copy and write file systems. And what data scrubbing does, it is effectively goes through the entire file system and every single disk and checks for errors. Because it's got these things called checksums. So checksums essentially allow it to figure out, hey, that data isn't actually right on that disk. And because of the math of it, they can actually generally correct from one bit error per section. And so as long as you're running a scrub, it will figure out, hey, that's wrong, and just automatically correct it in the background. This needs to be done in two different cases. One, regularly scheduled. It should be regularly scheduled to you every three months, every 90 days, somewhere around there. It should be done pretty regularly because over time, bit rot happens. Bit rot is going to inevitably happen. And with these file systems, you really do not want bit rot in the wrong place or honestly, any file system. And so by letting bit rot happen a little bit, but then getting corrected before it can happen again in the same section, you pretty much can have a file system that lasts for 50 years without having any kind of irreversible data corruption. So that is the one case where they should always be regularly scheduled. The other case is when anything goes wrong, especially power outages. So a power outage with a copy on write file system is handled actually really well because it's a copy on write file system. So copy on write means that essentially the data is written to the disk, the new data is written to disk, and then it's pointed at. So if the data is only partially written to disk, the next time the file system boots up, that change will have not made it on there, which is the benefit of a copy on write file system. But if you have unexpected power losses, weird things happen to hard drives because they have caches built in. They have little like 256 megabyte caches inside the drive that maybe it said it, written, it wrote a disk, but maybe it didn't. Now, that being said, ZFS and BTRFS will just figure that out. They'll run a scrub and they'll say, okay, you're lying, we need to do this. But scrubbing was never enabled on these drives. And so because of that, that scrubbing process never happened and all those little errors added up. And ZFS is pretty bad about, if it starts detecting too many errors in a disk, it expects that whatever corporation set up ZFS, it expects them to know what they're doing. And so if something gets a lot of errors, maybe it was because it hasn't been scrubbed in a while, it is going to say, oh, that, that drive's just bad and completely throw out that data essentially. Then what needs to happen with that is a resilvering. Resilvering happens automatically in TrueNAS as well. Did not happen with a manual command line setup though. All of these things should have been done, but I don't blame them for not because it's not a turnkey solution. You're just command lining it in and setting these things up is really tough. And so it was an inevitability that it was going to happen because when you're clustering 
one, you've got a lot more errors, and two, there was no turnkey solution at the time. Even with the turnkey solution that is TrueNAS scale today, TrueNAS scale uses GlusterFS to expand out their storage and lets you actually have multiple servers. Even with that, the only people sh who should be using a clustered file system are people who still really know what they're doing and have a large IT department and specifically have a lot more clients than actual servers because that's the only time you really get the benefit of a clustered file server. Otherwise, there is a lot of overhead per client that is going to slow you down so much more. So what ended up happening with LTT was their petabyte server, nobody ever looked at it. And every single time there's an unexpected power loss, anything, those errors just kept adding up. And so because of that, pretty much ZFS said, no, I'm not even gonna trust some of these disks. They were able to recover it. You can force them to, but ZFS was really mad about it. And it took them eight months to get all the data off because ZFS is not going to let them just make stuff up. Instead, you can just copy stuff off, but you can't just say, no, just trust that data. And so that's really what ended up happening. And overall, it was an inevitability. For anybody who is looking for a SMB file server, you should not think about clustering unless this is your enterprise and you've got 10,000 employees spread out around the country and you want to cluster it together. If you are just looking for a really fast storage over SMB, focus on having JBOD. Focus on connecting everything together because you're gonna have such a better time overall. And I really hope 45 drives, they make a great product. I really hope one day they add in the ability to just use SAS expansion and you can just buy storinators that have no CPU in them and are just SAS expansion because that's a great selling point. It makes everything so much easier because there's one pane of glass, one server that you ever have to deal with. But now finally, LTT is now using a JBOD with SAS expansion. So pretty much an entire server that really just has a SAS expansion port on the back and no real CPU in there. Instead, it is purely controlled by the master server that actually has all the data in it. And so you can just have one clean file server and then a bunch of different just disk shelves essentially is what they're called. And that is actually my plan setup. I've got a really fast all SSD file server, but I'm gonna want hard drives with it. And so for the hard drives, I'm just gonna buy a JBOD that's got SAS expansion ports on the back and just plug in directly into my file server, meaning I can have a super fast all SSD part of the volume and also a massive hard drive volume all on the exact same server, meaning I only have to configure one file server. All right, well, that's gonna be it for this overview. This is just the stuff I absolutely love and it's really interesting to me. Let me know if you wanna do more of these videos and if you have any other questions about it in the comments below. All right, have a good one, bye.